Well, first, let me apologize for my voice. I came back from Spain with a very bad head cold. Anyway, 1494 is getting a little ahead of our story, but I like this map because it so clearly delineates the city-state of Siena, which is where we're traveling next. I have a soft spot for Siena. The summer after my junior year in college, I had an internship with the United Nations International Labor Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. On weekends, I used my student rail pass to travel around Switzerland, Italy, and France. Uh, basically, I'd sleep on the train to save money, which is also how, how I could travel so far in a weekend. Anyway, a friend of mine who was really a friend of a friend was spending the six months before he started law school backpacking through Europe. He sent me a postcard from Siena and suggested that I should check it out. He said Siena's even more amazing than Florence and a lot less crowded. I found this hard to believe, at least the amazing part, but on his advice, I spent the next weekend in Siena and I absolutely loved it. So I wrote back to this friend of a friend and said I thought he had great taste. Uh, would he be interested in joining me on one of my weekend jaunts? So we met up in Antwerp, Belgium, and spent most of our time wandering around its splendid art museums, looking at Flemish art. We also got to know each other better that weekend, and I've now been married to the guy for 35 years. So yes, I have a soft spot for Siena, and yes, my husband and I still love to wander through art museums. Ms. Jacobs is going to say that I was really geeking out again, but in our five days in Spain last week, we visited eight art museums and about a dozen churches. Remember Goya's Judith and Whole Affair days? Here we are face to face. Anyway, back to Siena. Here is the town's medieval central square, and here is the Siena Duomo or Cathedral. Note the resemblance to the Gothic Cathedral at Orvieto, which you've already seen. So what Gothic features do you observe? And what characteristically Italian features? Well, the pointed gables are clearly Gothic, but the mosaic decorations show the heavy Byzantine influence on Italian art. Here's the very distinctive interior of Siena's cathedral with its alternating stripes of black and white marble. Let's return to Sister Wendy and let her take us on a tour of Siena. Here you see Duccio's masterpiece with its predella, a stepped pedestal below the altarpiece decorated with smaller scenes. You'll need to know that term on your test. This particular predella contains scenes of Christ's early life. Maesta means majesty, and it's a title given to many large Italian paintings of the Virgin in full majesty. Basically, it's a version of Mary as the Queen of Heaven. Siena had just won a great and unexpected victory over Florence the day after the Feast of the Assumption of the Virgin during which the people of Siena had rededicated themselves to Mary. So this painting, the centerpiece of Siena's Duomo or Cathedral, was vitally important to the citizens of the city-state. We tend to put art at the periphery of our lives to see it as you know, basically a pleasant diversion. For the people of the Italian city-states, art lay at the center of both religious and political life. And no more, nowhere was this more true than in Siena. Uh, this is a reconstruction, by the way. As you heard, this altarpiece was cut apart and sold in bits. Unlike Giotto's Arena Chapel, painted in fresco on wet plaster, this altarpiece was painted with egg tempera on wood. The gold leaf increased the painting's cost, of course, but it also significantly increased its reflection of light, which was especially important in dark cathedrals. Tempera also allowed for a wider range of deeper colors in fresco. In fact, in fact, dry secco was often used on fresco to provide deeper color. Do you remember the peeling blue sections you saw in the arena chapel? That was secco paint, paint over dry surface made with expensive azurite, but it did not last as well as the wet fresco. Duccio is often compared with his Florentine contemporary Giotto, and the comparison is not always fair to Duccio. Giotto is so deeply admired in part because he ushers in the Renaissance, Duccio is a more Gothic painter, more focused, as Sister Wendy pointed out, on heaven rather than earth. We tend to have a rather Darwinian admiration for progress, and therefore uh, often admire Giotto's innovations more, but Duccio really has to be appreciated on his own term, as I think Sister Wendy does. It's the reason I included that video clip. And if Duccio was more focused on heaven than on earth, his paintings still reflect the new humanism of his time, as spread by the increasingly powerful and popular Dominican and Franciscan orders. The faces are not anonymous, 
and entirely stylized. We see individual personalities. The bodies likewise have more sculptural modeling than Byzantine or Gothic works, although not as much as we'll see in Giotto's work. This is the front of the altarpiece with tall figures that were designed to be seen even from the back of the cathedral. Here we see the tender, approachable Mary of Gothic art. Again, while Duccio does not imitate Giotto's naturalism, he has still painted figures with volume who exist in an identifiable three-dimensional space. Here's the first Predella scene, the Annunciation, now in the National Gallery in London. Note again the obvious three-dimensional space and indeed Duccio's use of perspective, although this is still a pretty shallow architectural space. Here is the birth of Christ, now in the National Gallery of Washington, D.C. I love the curious angels. These are not blank faces. Note, too, that the painting shows Mary in both a stable and a cave. The stable was the Western European nativity tradition. The cave was the Byzantine tradition. Duccio decided to portray both, indicating that this is a transitional work and showing the influence of Byzantine art, particularly in the CNE school. The mattress style, by the way, is Roman. So how does the painting show continuous narration? <clears throat> well, we see the baby in the manger, but we also, down below, see baby Jesus bathed by midwives in a bathtub that resembles a chalice. That's almost certainly a deliberate reference back to the Mass. Here, too, you see the spectacular colors produced by egg tempera. And check out the sheep at the bottom. Once again, they're painted with much more naturalism than the people. Do you remember that this was true of Egyptian art as well? Here's a hypothetical reconstruction of the back of the Maesta, which faced the monk squire. It contained 40 biblical scenes. Here's one of those scenes along with its placement. We'll look at this painting more closely in just a minute. But I wanted you to see this uh, work from the back predella. It's the temptation of Christ. This is the scene where the devil presents Christ with all the kingdoms of the world and depicted here as medieval walled cities. Notice again the importance of architectural elements in Proto-Renaissance paintings and especially in the paintings of the CNE school. So here we get back to the betrayal of Jesus. The landscape is still fairly flat, but the painting still conveys a strong sense of movement. The bodies show considerable modeling. In other words, we see bodies under the clothes. Duccio also employs some chiaroscuro, the use of shading to help show the figure's modeling. Note how the gold leaf is used to edge Jesus' robe, creating a bright, complex, and fascinating line. And again, this is typical of Gothic art, which emphasizes line. So here we see Duccio's rendering of the same scene with the Maesta and the Arena Chapel, respectively. Excuse me, Duccio's and Giotto's. So what differences do you see? As you look at these, by the way, that's Duccio on the left and Giotto on the right. Well, you see from the Duccio work uh, that the tempera produces bright that the tempera produces brighter colors. Giotto um, more clearly employs perspective. Compare the shelves at the top of the painting. And by the way, I realize that these particular renditions don't really show the brighter colors as well in the tempera. That has to do with the uh, p the pictures that I clipped off the internet. But in fact, the Duccio painting would have brighter, more vibrant, and particularly more gold coloration. So again, Giotto's bodies are more thoroughly modeled. They have more volume and they are painted somewhat more realistically. Uh, note that in both of these, but particularly in Giotto's work, one of the figures has his back to us. This is typical um, of Giotto who uses this back to front uh, imagery to draw us into the picture. Duccio, on the other hand, has larger figures in the back. This is the reverse perspective. Uh, typical of Byzantine art, where the figures move out toward the viewer. As more mathematical perspective develops, we're going to see painters use techniques that draw us into the painting by showing us more realistic perspective. You'll see the beginnings of this in Giotto's version. In this scene, Christ is telling Mary Magdalene not to touch him. He has not yet been resurrected. It's a little hard to make out, but now all the... but. Now all of the lines in Christ's robe are gold leaf, symbolizing his resurrected body. Uh, one last image from this extraordinary work. The art historian I've been listening to 
uh, as I prepared these lectures, made what I thought was a very interesting point about this painting. The transfiguration is a theologically rich moment where Christ you know, acquires a non-worldly body. But it's something that's hard to capture as a narrative. For this reason, it's especially well-suited to Duccio's more cerebral, more theological style than the more naturalistic and narrative Franciscan style that's characteristic of Giotto. Simone Martini was probably a student of Duccio. He was also influenced by the sculpture of Pisano, which we saw in the last lecture, and by French Gothic sculpture and architecture. The term international style, which by the way shows up frequently on the AP exam, refers to Gothic painting uh, that exhibits multiple influences, Italian, French, even German. This was a period when artists increasingly traveled for commissions, and there was a lot of learning and imitation going on. The term is also used to describe a somewhat more decorative and courtly style, as demonstrated especially in the architectural decoration of this piece, which you should recognize as Gothic, and international style paintings tend to use a great deal of gold, as of course do Sienese works. Uh, and you see that this altar piece uses an extraordinary amount of gold leaf, again, to shine out in a dark cathedral. And you see those vibrant colors from egg tempera, especially the very bright oranges. Gabriel, by the way, is saying the familiar words, Hail Mary, full of grace. So how does the artist depict Mary's reaction to Gabriel? Well, she's actually shrinking away, alarm. That's an interesting, and I think it's a plausible psychological interpretation. I've always struggled a little with portrayals of Mary calmly accepting what I think would have been pretty startling news. Here's another painting that isn't in your textbook, but I'm including it because of the depth of architectural space, uh, which represents another breakthrough in European art. This is intuitive perspective, rather than mathematically precise perspective that we'll see in the next unit. Still, note how deeply we were drawn into this picture. Uh, and here's another architecturally deep painting by the other Lorenzetti brother. Compare it with the architecturally flat Annunciation by Martini. This work is so thoroughly discussed in the Sister Wendy video that I don't have a lot to add, except that you should really visit Siena and see it in person. Again, note that the ideal city is Siena itself, so it's very significant that this is in the town hall of Siena, the center of the city-state's government and public life. Note that the Lorenzetti brothers are both masterful paintings of architecture and very proud of their hometown. Renaissance art is all about civic pride. And this is still recognizably the Sienese countryside. Depictions of landscape were still rare in European paintings, and the landscapes we do see tend to be highly stylized. Again, this painting shows where we're heading. Here, under bad government, destruction and violence reign. I wanted to give you a closer look at the tyrant, clearly modeled on the devil. So let's return now to Assisi, where many of these great Sienese painters were hired to decorate the Basilica of San Francesco. Once again, Sister Wendy takes us on a tour. Notice especially her emphasis on the restraint and also the vibrant color of Sienese painting. One of the most famous works in San Francesco, Assisi, is the Lorenzetti Chapel. You will note the resemblance to Giotto's Arena Chapel, but the paintings themselves are more characteristically Sienese. Here we see the entry into Jerusalem. The painting has more of the Franciscan narrative style than many Sienese paintings. Note, for example, the children uh, climbing up the tree. We also see Lorenzetti's characteristic fascination with Italian urban architecture. The bodies have volume, while the overlapping figures and angled walls give us some sense of perspective and three-dimensional space. Again, the Renaissance is coming soon. Both Lorenzetti brothers disappeared suddenly in 1348, a year that the plague swept through Italy and basically brought Sienese art to a halt. Two-thirds of Siena's population died in that plague. I talked about the disasters of the 14th century in an earlier lecture. There was the Hundred Years' War, the global cooling and a resulting famine, the schism in the church between Avignon and Rome, and of course the plague. Arguably the plague was the greatest of these disasters. 
Here's a detail from the painting showing death striking down the wealthy and the young. This theme is echoed in Boccaccio's Decameron, which is a famous Renaissance work that features a group of young people that are holed up in a country villa trying to escape the plague and exchanging bawdy stories while they wait for death either to subside or to catch up with them. Okay, I couldn't resist another spoof. We will hear from Sister Wendy and Sister Randy again. Forgive the fourth grade humor. Well, this finishes up my first semester lectures, other than the test review podcast. Six units down, six units to go. In other words, guys, you are halfway there.